Hello, and welcome to Chapter 10.4 from Stevens' Introduction to Statistics, the Think and Do book. In this chapter, we're going to discuss multiple linear regression. It's just an introduction in hopes that this little cliffhanger may inspire you to take another course in statistics. Um, and we're going to control for variables in our linear regression. And the whole motivation for this is that, um, let's see, in the, in, the, in the previous section, we made a statement, actually from section 10.2, we said correlation does not prove cause and effect, right? We made that very clear. We said it doesn't mean there isn't cause and effect, but correlation doesn't prove it. But isn't that really what we want to know? Don't we want to know how the world works? I mean, you know, random patterns and associations and, and significant correlations, those are all well and good. But I want to know how things work. I want to know what causes something else to change, right? And one of the ways to help um, obtain this cause and effect relationship is through um, controlling for a variable in my um, linear regression. And when I say re controlling for a variable, I mean I'm actually going to include other variables. So instead of having just, say, the one variable where we did, um, you know, cricket chirps and temperature, we might have, uh, you know, another variable in there. Cricket chirps, temperature, um, time of night, or something like that. Right? So we can include other variables. That's what we mean by controlling for variables. It may sound like we're actually reducing our sample size so that all all measurements were taken at a certain time or the variables you know the, the the sample the items in the sample are all the same but that's not necessarily the case can, when you control for a variable you actually just introduce it into your model so here's an example where we will we will do that eventually we don't start there we start with this preliminary example incumbent campaign spending so what we have here is a list of 15 elections where incumbents were involved. Incumbent is where the person ha holding the position is also um, trying to win the election for that position the, the, for the following term. So there's 15 of them and in the first column we have the campaign expenditures in thousands of dollars. So this shows a campaign expenditure of seventy thousand, seventy point six seven thousand dollars right? And then the second column gives the incumbent's performance in terms of the percentage of votes, right? And so if you take this data and put it in a scatter plot right here, we'll put the expenditures down here because it's commonly believed that um, campaign expenditures cause changes in the um, outcome, right? So we'll put that down here, expenditures, and we'll put the performance in terms of percent votes on the y-axis. And what you'll notice right away is that it is a decreasing relationship. And if you get the correlation coefficient, you get a negative 0.611. And if you look at number for 15 for a sample size, what you'll see is you have to beat 0.514. So this relationship is the correlation is indeed significant, right? Because the absolute value of our value, remember we have to take the absolute value, so we get actually positive 0.611 to compare to our critical value. So we have a significant negative correlation between incumbent campaign expenditures and how well they do in the election. So that sort of is counterintuitive, right? We always thought that the more money you spend, the better you do. But in this case, it looks like the more money you spend, the worse you do. And in fact, if you look at the slope, negative 0.2, what this says is that for every extra $1,000 an incumbent spends on the campaign, he or she can expect to lose 0.2 percentage points. All right? So that's very bad. So, so um, to ask yourself, is the extra spending causing the incumbent to do worse in the election? And that's, you know, no matter how you come around, how you work around this, that's hard to believe that spending the extra money causes the incumbent to do worse. Um, so is there a lurking variable, perhaps? And if we play around and think about lurking variables, the, for, as far as an incumbent's re-election goes, Probably the number one factor 
is how well he or she did in their first term, right? If they had a terrible first term, that's going to really hinder their ability to win the second term. If they did really well, then they're, they have a good chance of, of winning the next term. So, so what if we include that? So we're going to control for how well they did in their first term. We're going to control for um, the actual quality of their first term in terms of their pre-election approval rate. So that's on the next page. So now we have two independent or causative variables. We have the incumbent's pre-election approval rate. We have their campaign expenditures, just like we had before. And then we have the performance of how they did in the election. And so what this first one shows is that the higher the pre-election approval, the less they spend on their campaign, which makes sense. If you're doing really well and everyone likes you, you don't have to spend as much on your campaign. So that, and that is in fact a significant correlation if you check in the back of the book. So we have a significant correlation there that makes perfectly good sense. And then if you look here at our second scatter plot, it says the higher the pre-election approval rating, right, the better the incumbent does in the election, which also makes perfectly good sense. The world is starting to make sense again here, right? And in fact, if you look at R, that's 0 0.980. That's a significant positive correlation. So really, it's the pre-election approval rating that we were missing in our last analysis when we just compared. Because in the last comparison, all we had was campaign expenditures and incumbent performance. And basically, what it showed was that the more they spent on a campaign, the worse they did. But that actually makes perfectly good sense when you bring in the pre-election approval rating because the lower campaign expenditures was, a cause of, was caused by doing well in the pre-election approval rating, which then also caused an increase in the um, performance in the election, right? So suddenly the world makes more sense. We include some variables, we control for variables by including the pre-election approval rating in our model, and things come out to have a little more meaning. And what we can do here, now that we have two independent variables, we can have a multiple linear regression equation. And again, we need software to, um, to calculate these variables. But what it says is the percent votes in the election, all right, is equal to 0 0.8, that's one slope, times the approval, current approval rating, plus 0 0.10 times the spending, plus the um, intercept, right? So that's M1, X1, M2, X2. So there's two slopes. There's the 0.8 and the 0.1. What this 0.8 is saying is that for every increase in approval, for every percent increase in approval, the incumbent can expect a 0.8% increase in the election. That's good. It means it certainly demonstrates that approval, pre-election approval rating uh, plays a big factor. But then what it does also show is that there's a positive correlation between spending and election. Right? What that says is that for every extra $1,000 spent, the incumbent can expect 0.1% of a percentage point increase. So it's not a very, it's not a big increase, but at least it's positive. It makes sense. If you're going to spend more money on your election, that should help in some sense, and what it, in some way. And, and what this says is that it does, but it's not nearly as important as the approval rating. Right? So suddenly the cause and effect makes much more sense. It all fits together nicely, but we needed to control for that variable of pre-election uh, campaign spending. And this is called multivariable um, regression, multivariable correlation, and it would be in a, in a second course in statistics. Um, and so hopefully this has inspired you to maybe consider taking such a second course. So that wraps up Chapter 10. We'll do the summary worksheet and move on to Chapter 11. It was a pleasure having you here. And I will see you in the summary worksheet. Bye.